understanding the background helps you to understand what you're looking at, what you're studying. Now, many individuals have trouble with the prophecy in Zechariah. They have a hard time understanding. Is that something that's been fulfilled in the past or something that we can expect to be fulfilled in the future? Is this something that is going to be in the millennial reign of Christ? Or is this something that, uh, that the individuals would have had happen in the past? Now, there's a couple things right in the introduction that will help you with those with that and understanding that. First of all, look at the, the, uh, who was the king at that time. It was the second year of Darius. Well, we know that Darius, of course, would have been one of the kings of the Medo-Persian Empire. And we know that this would have been uh, part of the age of the... Uh, he, would, he would have uh, been part of the age of the Gentile kingdoms or the Gentile nations. And so the fact that Darius would have been the king at this time, we understand that Israel, of course, uh, was not the kingdom that, was, that God was working through to the rest of the, of the world. Now, friend, if you look at history, you'll see from that time until this time as well that Israel has not been the, the uh, ruling nation in the world. In other words, people have not been under the subjection of Israel all the way from that time. But something else that's interesting to note is that this is a post-exilic book. In other words, uh, Zechariah's family would have been part of the 50,000 uh, Jews who, had, who uh, were in exile that would have gone back uh, to Israel, gone back to uh, in Jerusalem, in those areas. And so Zechariah is not a part of the captivity. He's not a captive individual. He's not a uh, prophet during the captivity. Matter of fact, looking at the material, one of the beginning uh, bits of material is the same thing that we saw in Haggai. Haggai is a book where God is calling on the nation of Israel to rebuild the temple. Hey, you live in houses that have, and sealed houses, but where is God dwelling? And the problem with the people was they said, we couldn't afford to rebuild your house. God, we don't have the resources. Uh, God told him, he says, you go out and you plant and you, uh, and you have a harvest and your harvest isn't enough. Uh, you go down and you, you go to the mill and you go and you get, the, to get 50 pounds and you get 20 pounds. And everything that you're doing is not enough. And so the people's reason for not taking care of the Lord's matters was they said, we don't have enough ourselves, and when our needs are met, then we'll make God a priority. And God's command to the nation of Israel, make me a priority now. Make me a priority now, and I'll supply your needs after. And you know, friend, there's a principle there that is undying. It's always true that if you're faithful to God, He'll never be unfaithful to you. But if you're unfaithful to Him, He has no obligation to you. Many Christians have a hard time with this whole thing. They have a hard time surrendering their needs to God and recognizing that if I'll just serve God, if I'll just live for Him, then I won't have needs. Uh, teenagers, please pay attention, okay? I'm, I'm having a hard time. Every time I look over there, I get distracted and I lose my train of thought. So next week, um, split up and, and spread out, sit up closer, okay? Because I can't pay attention when you're uh, doing your own thing. All right, thank you. Um, and so, uh, anyway, the, uh, in, in Haggai, we, we see this exhortation, this command to rebuild the temple. God says, rebuild my temple. This is the thing that ought to be your priority. And, of course, they, uh, Zerubbabel and, Josh, and Joshua, the high priest, Zerubbabel would have been the, the governor at the time, and Joshua, the high priest, both of them are referred to in Zechariah. Both of those individuals had a heart after God. They responded to the preaching and the message of the Word of God, and they rebuilt it. Well, then what, what was the question that was asked? Is this temple anything like the one in its former glory? And the answer was no. Uh, Haggai said, how many of you remember the first temple? How many of you were alive during that time, during those generations? And there would have been some individuals, probably not Haggai himself, that would have remembered that. And friend, I want to say to you, God's never impressed with an edifice. And that was the point that Haggai was making. God's not impressed with the beauty or the splendor, the magnificence of an edifice God says, what I want is, is obedience. I want people to live for me and to make me a priority. And he used it. He gave great, great blessing, great promise to Israel. So here's a, the first thing we see is a little bit of, of the time. We see that the times of the Gentiles, and I, I had mentioned just a bit ago that, uh, that the, the, it's, many individuals have a hard time understanding prophecies, but if you'll understand that the, that the prophecies are post-exilic. In other words, the people aren't in exile. They're free to go back to their homeland. And so the prophecies aren't, Israel is going to be, when it, when it talks about the kingdom and the splendors of the kingdom, you can understand that two things. First of all, if they were uh, prophecies that were contemporary, in other words, if they weren't prophetic of the reign of Christ, 
then those prophecies were never realized, which would mean one of two things. Either the Scripture is, either this isn't, it doesn't belong in the Scripture, or God's not done working yet. And of course, if you understand the Scripture, it's very easy to understand it when you study it in parallel with the book of Revelation. And we'll do a lot of that. This is a book that really meshes, and really that the revelation of the Scriptures sheds a lot of light on. Now, uh, we, we mentioned about Berechiah, and, and uh, he was the son of Berechiah, uh, the son of Iddo, the prophet. And uh, so Zechariah is Berechiah's son, but it, Berechiah would not have had a long life. Iddo would have been uh, his grandfather. Now, he immediately begins a message. And friend, I want to say to you, the first message that ought to be preached to anybody is the message of repentance. The first message that ought to be preached to anybody is repentance. Before God can do anything, there must be a change of mind about what God can do, what God is allowed to do. Friend, I want to say something to you tonight, and, and it's a Bible doctrine of Bible teaching. Every Christian ought to understand biblical repentance. And this is an area where many Christians like to bicker, and they like to argue, and they like to fight, and they like to uh, come up with their knee-jerk or reactive theology, and usually they'll take repentance and they'll restrict it to the area of salvation. And they'll make every, every instance of repentance in the Bible talking about salvation. And they'll teach things that the Bible doesn't teach about how we're saved in the part of repentance in our salvation. You know, if you do a study and you do a careful, close study of repentance in the Scripture, and a good place to begin that would be just doing a study through the book of Romans. And you look at every instance where the Scripture refers to repentance in the, within the context or the confines of talking about salvation, you will find that repentance has everything to do with Jesus Christ. has everything to do with your heart's attitude toward God and your relationship with Him. You study the book of Romans, you know the folks will say, well, repentance, you have to repent of your sins to be saved. My friend, I don't disagree with that at all. I don't have a problem with that at all. I know folks that do, and they would disagree with that. And they'd have good reasons because many people that make that statement don't believe what the Bible teaches about repentance in the context of salvation. My friend, uh, repentance, though, is not just about returning from our sin. Really, it is turning from a heart's attitude of unbelief to a heart's attitude of belief. The beginning of the book of Romans very clearly lays out in the Scripture the fact that every individual who has ever been born is accountable to God. The first chapter of Romans talks about we know there is a God because of what because of creation, because of the way God created us, and because of the creation He created us within, those things in and of themselves are evidence enough that causes every individual, whoever has been born, to be accountable for the knowledge of God. And the Bible goes on to be more specific about that. Not just that, generally speaking, there is God or a God or something that is God-like or God's, but the Bible teaches that, yeah, the, the, the scripture, that in our hearts we're born not just knowing there's a God, but every single person who's ever been born knows the character of God, or the Scripture refers to it as the Godhead, that He is a one God, that He's a supreme God. Even the Trinity concept is understood in our hearts because we're born, and that's what the Scripture uh, teaches, and I believe it. Well, and then the Bible says the reason that individuals don't turn to Christ and don't believe in God isn't because they cannot, isn't because they have not heard of God, it's because they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. And so it's a choice. It says, you know what, this is in my knowledge, I know there's a God, but I don't like Him or I'm angry at Him or I disapprove of His character, I don't think He should be the way that He is. And so in their knowledge they say, out with you God, and they become what we believe, what we refer to as an atheist or an individual that says, I don't believe there's a God. My friend, I want to say to you, they're not really atheists. They're individuals that have made a choice not to uh, turn to God or not to accept Him for who He is. And friend, they are individuals who have continued in their choice of unbelief. Now friend, can I say to you tonight that the, end of the difference between a person who has repented in the context of salvation and a person who has not repented in the context of salvation is a difference between an individual who has made a choice to turn from their unbelief to Christ and an individual who has not made a choice to turn from their unbelief to Christ and they've instead replace that with something else. You can say, Pastor, that involves returning from sin. I agree with you. I don't disagree with that at all. I believe the Bible teaches that very clearly. But friend, the thing that sends a person to hell is refusing Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh unto the Father but by me. And it's important that we turn to Christ and we come to God, the Scripture says, as He is. 
And what that means is we don't come to God, the God in our mind. And many individuals turn to a God in their mind.